Professor Diggory Kirk, the mysterious yet wise old man who acts as a counselor, mentor, and guide to the Pevensey children in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And if you're reading Narnia in the right order, the publication order, that is, here's a spoiler. He also happened to be one of the first people to ever enter Narnia as a young boy and the magician's nephew. And just like the Pevensey children, what most people don't realize is that when you take a closer look, there's much more to Diggory than meets the eye. And his story is infused with deep meaning beyond what you may have ever understood before. Well, what makes Diggory Diggory? To answer that, we need to know a little bit more about the man that created him. And today, we're gonna take a closer look at Diggory and in doing so, we'll take a closer look at his creator, C.S. Lewis himself. Now, before we get started, just a quick note. You know, in this season of Thanksgiving, I am so thankful for all of my Patreon supporters who have worked so hard to make this channel possible. Your encouragement and support are what keep this channel going. So from all of us, we say thank you. Now let's get started. It's time to leave the Shadowlands behind and step into a world that's more real than our own. It's time to follow me into the wardrobe. For C.S. Lewis, or Jack as his friends and family called him, his childhood was one filled with books. As he recalls in his autobiography, he was a creature of the indoors and most importantly, of books. Endless books, as he put it. Florence, his mother, was also a foundational influence in his life. Readers of Jack's autobiography, surprised by joy, find an immediate hint of what lies in store for Lewis in his early years by the opening quotation taken from Paradise Lost. Happy, but for so happy, ill secured. Jack's mother, Florence, fell ill with cancer when Lewis was around the age of nine. He recalls being in bed with a toothache, but for Jack, what hurt even more than that tooth was the fact that his mother was absent. As Lewis explained, that was because she was ill too. And what was odd was that there were several doctors in her room and voices and comings and goings all over the house and doors shutting and opening. It seemed to last for hours. And then my father in tears came into my room and began to try to convey to my terrified mind things it had never conceived before. It was in fact cancer and followed the usual course. An operation, they operated in the patient's house in those days, an apparent convalescence, a return of the disease and increasing pain, and then death. My father never fully recovered from this loss. Now for you Narnian readers, you're probably already seeing the similarities faced by Diggory and the magician's nephew. In the opening of the book, he's caught by his neighbor, Polly Plummer, crying. Now Diggory in defense replies that his crying is perfectly reasonable, considering his new situation of his father away in India and his mother ill, dying in fact. Now Lewis never shied away from such difficult topics, even in Narnia with his young audience. In his essay on three ways of writing for children, he writes, the child as a reader is neither to be patronized nor idolized. We talk to him as man to man. You see, Lewis understood that death and suffering are faced by not just adults, but by children as well. And Lewis reflects that a child's suffering is no lesser, just different. For Diggory, one of the worst parts of this pain was experiencing the isolation from his mother, even while being in the same house. It's all consuming for him. In fact, she's one of the last things he thinks about before following Polly through to the wood between the worlds. Lewis experienced the same type of all-consuming isolation, and for him, it was a type of loss before the loss. Here's how he described it. We lost her gradually as she was gradually withdrawn from our life into the hands of nurses and delirium and morphia. As our whole existence changed into something alien and menacing, as the house became full of strange smells and midnight noises and sinister whispered conversation. Lewis's story ends with the heartbreaking events of his mother dying. And for Diggory, it seems like his mother is destined to suffer the same fate. It's a fate that weighs so heavily on his heart that when Diggory first meets Aslan in the newly made land of Narnia, the very first words he ever spoke to Aslan are about his mother. Please, Mr. Lion, Aslan, sir, said Diggory. Could you, may I, please, will you give me some magic fruit of this country? to make mother well? Now, instead of answering Diggory's question, Aslan ignores it, instead turning the situation back to Diggory. 
But when Aslan gives Diggory the task to help protect Narnia, he has a momentary thought of making a bargain with Aslan. He's tempted to say, I'll try and help you if you promise to help my mother. But he realized just in time that this lion was not at all the sort of person one could try to make bargains with. Now Diggory's wisdom must have been informed by Jack's own mistakes. You see, when Lewis's mother was sick, he viewed God as someone who could not only be bargained with, but someone who, with enough earnestness and firm belief, could be tamed, convinced to maybe even produce a miracle on demand. Here's how Jack explained it. When her case was pronounced hopeless, I remembered what I had been taught, that prayers offered in faith would be granted. I accordingly set myself to produce by will a power of firm belief that my prayers for her recovery would be successful. And as I thought, I achieved it. Now, it's very interesting to note his word choice just a few sentences later. I had approached God or my idea of God without love, without awe, even without fear. He was, in my mental picture of this miracle, to appear neither as savior nor as judge, but merely as a magician. Did you catch that word, magician? It's more than a coincidence. For who did Diggory learn to truly trust? His uncle, the magician, or Aslan, his creator? You see, Diggory, instead of bargaining, turns to grief and honesty, bearing his heart to Aslan. And what Diggory finds as he lifts his head is Aslan's own face, full of tears, as if the lion must really be sorrier about his mother than he was himself. In an act of selfless obedience to Aslan, Diggory brings back the fruit that Aslan asked for, resisting the temptation from Jadis and his own heart to save his mother instead of obeying Aslan. And in the end, in his mercy, Aslan gives Diggory the very thing he had been willing to sacrifice. In a way, Lewis took the opportunity to rewrite his own childhood in the final chapter of The Magician's Nephew. You see, Diggory brings back the apple of life given by Aslan to his mother. She eats the fruit before going to sleep, a true and good sleep. It was a sleep that evaded Jack's own mother in her final days. As we're told in The Magician's Nephew, Diggory's mother slept a real, natural, gentle sleep without any of those nasty drugs. And unlike Jack's mother, Diggory's mother recovers. Now sadly, in our world, years later, Lewis would experience a new wave of grief when his wife, Joy, died of cancer as well. His pain was staggering and his honest and raw reflections on that grief would later become the book, A Grief Observed. In the final chapter of this book, he describes his experience in a profound way, saying, When I lay these questions before God, I get no answer, but rather a special sort of no answer. It is not the locked door, it's more like a silent, certainly not uncompassionate gaze as though he shook his head, not in refusal, but waving the question, like, peace, child, you don't understand. You see, it's no coincidence that Aslan also gave Diggory no answer. But Lewis understood things differently this time, and it wasn't just because instead of a young boy, he was now an old man. You see, by this time, Jack had become a Christian. And because of this faith, he began to truly believe in the hope of life after death. Now, when Diggory left Narnia, the evil was still there. Narnia was not made perfect, and Diggory was not given a promise that death would forever be held at bay. The witch would return. But the promise was made that one day evil would be dealt with, and it would be dealt with by Aslan himself. You see, in this story, in this story of pain and grief, what Lewis did give his Narnian readers above all else was hope. Hope in a final and forever victory. Because in this world, there is true joy and hope to be found. And it is only found further up and further in.